Hey, just like John said, we have been walking through the book of Mark, which is once a year at Northway, if you're not familiar with our teaching, preaching calendar. Uh, pastor Scott, our lead pastor, whom you usually hear from at this time on video, likes to walk through a book. And so what they did this year was kind of cool. They, uh, pastor Scott saw that most of the interactions that Jesus had in the book of Mark with people really fell into three distinct categories. So he's just broken the study through the book of the Mar Mark into those three distinct categories. And so we're in the middle, or actually we're in the middle of the full book of Mark series, but we're wrapping up the crowds portion. So where Jesus spoke to uh, the crowds, everywhere he went in public ministry, massive crowds always followed him. And so we can learn a ton as we look at these texts. And so I just want to start off real quick. Um, how many of you, men or women in the room, would just lift your hand up if you were a cheerleader at some point, okay? You're proud of that, Ashley. Ashley was like, heck yeah. Is that, no? All right, so let me see who else. I was picking on her, okay? Any other cheerleaders? Yes? In the back? Oh, okay, I think I see a couple hands back there. No? No strong male cheerleaders? None? No? That's all right. It's cool. So, so I wanted to know my cheerleaders in the group because I want to speak to you real quick. I, I'm not making fun of you. I'm, I'm not. I, I love cheerleaders. They were wonderful. I played basketball. Uh, just the 6'6 six, six thing kind of just dictated that you do that. And so I played all the way through high school, got to play a little bit in college before I gave up my scholarship and came back home, got serious about life, got to play overseas a little bit and do some work for the Lord overseas when using tool, the basket, basketball as a tool. And so there were always cheerleaders around. And, and I got to admit, uh, cheering for basketball is, is hard. I mean, I'm going to give it to you guys and girls. It's, it's difficult, but I never really, I'm getting some really nasty looks right now. Y'all think that I'm going to like, the cheerleaders are like glaring at me, going to poke my eyeballs out with spirit fingers or, or something. So but it, I, I was playing the game, and I rode the bench a lot. So, so I, I would always listen to what the cheerleaders were doing. And I, I never really understood some of their cheers. It, it kind of just felt like, if I'm just being honest, that football, man, you guys, cheerleaders, you got it together. Like, I get it. And, 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 and some of the other sports. But basketball, it just didn't seem to click with what we were trying to do on the court. And, and it felt like you just kind of missed the point, maybe miss the understanding of the game, if I can just say that in, in, a, in a kind kind way. I'm so going to get beat up after this. And so I, I, I wanted to give a couple of examples of some cheers that, that I heard throughout my basketball playing career. I hope I'm not going to perform them, but I hope I, I get the, the rhyme or whatever you call it right. So see, here's one that I didn't think cheerleaders really got. So, so it goes like this. Chugga, 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 H2O. Chug a water, chug a water, go, go, go. <laughs> and I just sitting there listening to that and the sidelines like, what in the world does that mean? We're supposed to stay hydrated? I mean, yeah, all right, I, I, didn't, I didn't get it. Here's, a, here's another one that I just didn't think that they got. Watermelon, watermelon, watermelon rind. Look at the scoreboard to see who's behind. I just thought, what are we talking about? fruits for in basketball. I think he's just kind of missed the whole, whole point. I don't know, maybe not. And then when I played in high school, so I, I, I have fond memories of my basketball playing days. And so we were the, the Trojan, the hazel green Trojans. Yes, I played for a school that was a color, hazel green Trojans. So I inter, 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 interjected the Trojans into this. And so here's one I heard a lot. Trojans got the rhythm. Trojans got the motion. And when we get together, we cause a commotion. I don't know, maybe they thought it was the dance crew. I don't, I don't know. We never did. We never had rhythm. I don't know. And here's the last one. I'll save the best for last. You guys just didn't feel like it was in sync. Let me see if I can get this one right. Let me get the, 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 the meter right. I said, bang, bang, choo-choo train. <laughs> Can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Wind us up. We'll do our thang. Not thing. Thang, because it has to rhyme with train. But get this. We know karate, <laughs> we know kung fu, you mess with us and we'll mess with you. That's good, right? I didn't write these, they're just, I just always felt like 
that the cheerleaders sometimes kind of missed out on why we were actually there. They missed out on like the real intent, in basketball at least, of what we were trying to accomplish on the courts. And I have a little fun with you this morning, but just to kind of illustrate a little bit, I think, friends, I wonder how many people in the crowd of Jesus' time, when they were circled around and they were attracted to him, how many of those people really missed out completely on what was happening right in front of them? They gathered around Jesus, but I wonder how many missed out on who Jesus was and why he was there in Jerusalem to begin with. It's like they were missing out on the full intent of what was going on. And my hope for the crowd here today, here at Northway and across all of our other campuses, is that you won't miss who Jesus is. And more importantly, that you won't miss what Jesus has for you today. Because I'm going to tell you that he has a purpose and a plan for you being here in this room. You may not realize it. You may not even understand it. You may not have thought that. You may have just kind of wandered in here off the street to get some cool air conditioner because you don't have air conditioner at your house or something or get some donuts and coffee. Hey, that's cool. We love that. Keep coming. But you just might not get it. But I want you to know that you're here today and if you'll open your heart and not just be a part of the crowd, which we'll define a little bit later, God has a purpose for you. You see, it's easy to be present in this crowd and miss the meaning of why you're here. It's easy to let your expectations dictate what you're going to get out of this morning's time together or your time with God. But I want to challenge you in the next like 15, 20 minutes. It's a pretty short one. I know those of you heard me preach on Marathon Weekend, you're probably like, yeah, right, 15, 20 minutes. But I don't know what happened on that sermon. I'm just, that was a different guy. I have gone back. I told John and some of the staff, I have gone back and looked at my notes, and I don't know how it went that long. I promise this one's going to be a little bit better. We'll make it up to you, okay? But just zone in with me here for the next 15, 20 minutes or so, and I just want you to lay down your expectations and what you think you want to get out of today and, and try to get beyond the focus of the crowd because I believe you can find something so much deeper and greater if you'll just listen closely. You might just find the reason why you're here today apart from the crowd. And so let's set a little bit of background up. John read some of the, the text and set us up as we were going into this, but I want to give you a little bit of background and then we're going to read through some of the text. So set the stage for you in Mark 15. This is actually an eyewitness account of the Apostle Peter who has been recorded. It's been recorded by Mark, okay? And for the last year, we come up in this text, and we see that Jesus has been gaining some real serious popularity out in the communities and in the places where he traveled. And a lot of popularity and crowds and people were following and gathering to hear his teachings. People were coming to be healed by him. And we come up on the text where Jesus feeds the 5,000. And if you look at other things, most of the time um, um, that they only counted during these days the men. So we think maybe the crowds could have been as many if you counted the children and the women. It could have been likely like 15, 20,000 people. But we know at least 5,000. But by the count records of the day, we think it might could have been 15, 20,000 people where Jesus takes his kids' lunch, you know, and he like divides it up and feeds all these people. This miracle takes place. And Jesus' teachings during this time are so radical. I mean, look, let me just say this. Jesus' teachings today are radical. I mean, you, you read some of this stuff and it is just Man, it's, it is crazy. It's on the edge. But the religious leaders, they didn't agree with pretty much anything that Jesus had to say. And because and, he taught things like this, he would be out there saying, I'm the son of God. And they didn't like that very much. He would say that he's the Messiah or the Savior who's going to take away the sin of the world, save the world. They didn't like him because he would say things like he's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. Nobody gets to God unless they believe and follow him, Jesus. And so the leaders of the day didn't like Jesus very much. And so there's some radical claims, and, and the crowd really has three options when it comes to Jesus. And perhaps you've heard this before. You've read this, and I believe it's the same options we have today when you approach the teachings of Jesus, these radical teachings, the same thing that they had. Number one, Jesus is a liar. I mean, that's an option. You can look at the things that he said, and you can come to the conclusion on your own and say that Jesus just lied. Or number two, you could say that he's a lunatic. <laughs> he's just out of his mind, and it was just this weird moment in time, and he's just crazy, off his rocker. Or you could say that Jesus is legit. 
that he really was who that he said he was. And so there were three options, and the crowd has to choose what they're going to believe about Jesus. And we know how the religious leaders chose. We're going to see this. They believed that he was just a flat-out liar because Mark records in chapter 14, so if you have your uh, phones or your Bibles, we also have it up on the screens here for you, but I'd love for you to read it in your, in your, uh, your phones or whatever. Make, make notes or marks so you can go back and read it again. But in Mark... He records in chapter 14 that they have now arrested Jesus on the hills of all this, and they take him to court in the middle of the night in secret. By the way, nothing good happens in secret. Nothing good happens in the veil of darkness. And, and some of you are sitting there saying, okay, cool, I don't, you know, I'm, I don't go out and do things in dark. That's not what I'm talking about. If, if you, let me just say this. I mean, can I, I'm just going to meddle a little bit. That's a good old southern word, or just get up in your business, you know. So if, if, if you have just a little, maybe you've not done anything physically, but you've had just a little, you got that relationship with a coworker, and you just, you wouldn't want your spouse to know about it. You haven't done anything yet, but that's the veil of darkness. You're headed towards destruction. Nothing good and positive happens under the veil of secrecy or under the veil of darkness. And we see a perfect example of this when in the middle of the night, in secret, they go to try to convict Jesus of a crime. Look at Mark chapter 14, verse 55. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus in order to put him to death, but they didn't find any. For many bore a false witness against Jesus, but their testimonies didn't agree with one another. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, Well, we heard him say that he'll destroy this very temple that's made with our hands and with hands, and then three days later he'll build it up, not made with hands. It was like speaking into existence. And yet even about their testimony, they didn't agree. So, so here we see that they couldn't nail him down on these false charges. So the high priest takes it into his own hands, and he asks Jesus. He's kind of like, forget this. I can't get any anything against you. So he actually just flat out asked Jesus, are you the son of God? Do you believe you're the Messiah? And Jesus said, I am. And the chief priest said, well, what more do we need? This guy's a lunatic and he's a liar. He believes he's the savior of the world. What more do you people need? And, and look in Mark chapter 14, verse 64, the, the high priest says, you've heard his blasphemy. So what's your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. Who's the all there? The crowds that begin to form. And so they all condemn him. Here you have Jesus falsely accused, falsely condemned to death as an innocent man, secretly behind closed doors. But now he's paraded out in the public, out into their eyes as a prisoner. And then he's taken to the governor, Pilate, and the chief priest accused Jesus of all sorts of things. Look at chapter 15, verse 11. This is very important to see because this is kind of the what I like to call the hinge verse of where we're trying to go this morning. It takes us to the other side. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd. The chief priests stirred up the crowd. They were egging on the crowd with these trumped up charges and false information. And Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent. But look at the power of the crowd's voice. Look what he said in Mark chapter 15, 2, 12 through 15. And Pilate, again, now he's before Pilate. Pilate again says, Then what shall I do to the man that you call king of the Jews? And they cried out. Now it's the crowd. Do you see how it's moved from secrecy and the hate of the leaders done at night out in the public? Now the crowd is stirred into a frenzy. And they yell out to him, Crucify him. And Pilate said to him, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to do what? satisfy the crowd, release for them Barabbas, who was another prisoner, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. So Roman guards, we know from the story, tortured Jesus with these whips and these sharp metal objects and cat of nine tails. If you know specifically history, they would be not just a regular whip. It was a whip that had many ends, and they would sometimes tie at the end pieces of rock and glass and sharp metal objects. And the point of this, the Romans were great at torture and prolonging death. And they would whip the prisoner, and Jesus was whipped. And the point was so that it would hit and not just slide off and leave whiplashes bad enough. 
but it would grab into the flesh and they would snatch it back and rip the flesh off of him. If you look at any sign, modern science about not just Jesus' crucifixion, but just this type of crucifixion during the Roman days, they say that many times their organs were actually, after a scourging, were left where you could see the internal organs. It was such a bad, a bad experience. And Jesus was so weak, perhaps from blood loss, he's supposed to be carrying this wooden cross up to a place called Golgotha, which literally means the place of the skull. And he keeps stumbling. They get tired of waiting. So they finally pull a guy out of the crowd named Simon of Cyrene and make him carry the cross on up. And this place of the skull, Golgotha, would have been a very public place that people would have passed by every single day because the Romans knew how to do it. That's how they would keep control. They would put the place of torment and shame and torture in the place of death where the whole communities would have to pass by it every single day. It would be like for us here in Pittsburgh, the place of torment and death and execution might be down at the Point Park. So that every Google map that you looked at, you saw the place. And so every time you drove down and had a nice evening, afternoon with your family, you saw the place so that you would remember to do right because that's where you'll end up. And crucifixion is what happens to criminals. And they crucified the innocent Jesus between two criminals and hanging there naked on the cross look at what the crowd yells and slanders to Jesus in Mark 15 29 through 32 and those who passed by they mocked him and wagged their heads and their fingers and said aha you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days save yourself come down off of that cross and also the chief priests with the scribes they mocked him to one another saying, hey, he saved others, but he can't even save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from that cross that we can see and we can believe. And those who even crucified him and those who were crucified with him also reviled him. See, the crowd was present for the most impactful event in human history, and yet they missed out on it completely. Swayed by, listen, Swayed by false information, popular opinion, emotional momentum. The crowd missed the reason why Jesus was even hanging there for them to see. And you got to catch this today. You got to catch this. They were seeing what they were told to see. They were told to see a criminal. And the people who passed by, they scoffed at Jesus. They mocked him. And they did so because he wasn't the Messiah and the Savior that they were expecting him to be. He wasn't who they thought he would be. Their expectations didn't match reality. Their expectations were wrong, and they missed the salvation that was hanging right in front of them all along. And friends, this isn't something that just happened to that crowd that day. It still happens today. With life in general, and specifically when it comes to the things of God, we have to see that our wrong expectations can set us up for pain, confusion, or even disappointment. And so if you'll take out your notes, real quickly, I want to hit three truths about wrong expectations this morning. I want you to notice, first of all, as we've read these texts, that wrong expectations are often reinforced by the crowd. And I've read that over and over and over again, and, and I know that seems a little wordy and you have to sit there and think about it, but I, I think I can give you an illustration to help understand how wrong expectations are often reinforced by the crowd. So... My wife, Mandy, who's back, back at our, our, our first home uh, in, uh, in Alabama right now, uh, <clears throat> she left me for a week with, with our three kids, two dogs and a cat. <laughs> but I'm okay. <laughs> Went grocery shopping yesterday with them for the first time. <laughs> no, they're awesome. But when Mandy, my beautiful wife, and I got married, uh, I had some big expectations of Mandy, and she had expectations of me. Married couples in the room. And how many of you had expectations of your spouse? I'm not going to make fun of you like I did the cheerleaders. I learned my lesson. It's just, just, just be honest. Uh, how many of you had expectations about your spouse going into the marriage? Raise your hand. How many of you, put your hands down. Now, how many of you, those expectations didn't match up at all? Raise your hand. You're like, some of you are like, <laughs> okay, I don't know if I can read. All the dudes. See, Matt's like Mr. Bold right now. Yeah, hey, man, because your wife ain't here, dude. <laughs> Big talker. 
And me and Brandon, we got you. We're going to tell her. <laughs> I mean, I expected like supper is going to be cooked and ready every night. Even though she works, like she's just going to magically figure out a way to do it. And I come home and, you know. She would always be perfectly manicured or makeup on, just like she was in our wedding pictures. She'd just wake up, you know, oh, hey, baby. It didn't work like that. <laughs> she would always see my side of things, and we would never disagree. Yeah, baby, I, I, yeah, I understand. You're right. Never heard that. And whenever she didn't live up to my expectations, I would get mad. I would get frustrated. Amen? That's just a natural part of of marriage. You have to learn to work through those things. Wrong expectations are often reinforced by the things that we bring into the marriage or by the things that we're involved in or the crowds or the people we're around as we grow up. And whenever I didn't live up to her expectations, that actually come to think about it, I don't think I ever have not lived up to her expectations. I, yeah, I don't think. No, I'm playing. I, I failed miserably. And whenever I didn't live up to her expectations, she was disappointed with me. And there was a bit of a rift in the relationship. And it's not a bad thing to have expectations. We have to realize that the wrong expectations have consequences. And so I think that it would be wise when we're looking at these texts and we're dealing with this character, Jesus, that we should double check our expectations today. Uh, uh, the, what is it Aaron Rodgers does? The, we, should, we should double check our expectations today, amen? Do you guys know that I get at least one or two times a week that people ask me if I'm Aaron Rodgers? True story. At least, at least once a week people will ask me that. I've just started saying, yeah, I'm in town looking, they're, they're looking at trading me for Ben Roethlisberger. Shh, don't tell anybody. And I sign autographs. It's awesome. So much fun. <laughs> I had a girl ask me when I preached at the Oakland campus uh, a couple weeks ago, and she came up to me and said, before you got up there, I thought we had a special guest. I was like, really? She's like, Aaron Rodgers. Oh, come on. You know, said, true. I don't, I don't see it, but whatever. So we need to double check our expectations because the thing about our wrong expectations is that they're often reinforced by the crowd, the people we grow up with, the people that are around us. And oftentimes it's by people who don't have our best interest in mind. For instance, the crowd is telling our young couples today, now listen to me, and I'll preach some truth, truth to you this morning. The crowd, the culture is telling our young couples today that it's good and completely normal to live together before they're married. But what the crowd and what has become just normal in our society is not telling them is that according to multiple, multiple studies, but I'll just cite one, the National Institute of Child Health and Development, shows statistics like this that completely prove that the crowd is wrong. First of all, that living together is considered to be more stressful than being married. It tells that just over 50% of first cohabitating couples ever get married. It tells us that in the United States, couples who live together are at greater risk for divorce than non-cohabitating couples. It tells us that couples who live together before marriage tend to divorce earlier in their marriage. But the crowd's cultural expectation reinforces this popular trend, even though it's not good for young couples. And dear friends, it's sin. And our wrong expectations are often reinforced by crowds, and that's what's happening with the crowds around Jesus, and it's what's happening with the crowds around us today. The crowd gets caught up into something that they don't know what is good for them. Wrong expectations are often reinforced by the crowds, and if we're not careful, we won't even know what's good for us. You know, there used to be a day when it was helpful to be a Christian and a member of a local church. Used to be a day when if you were... A real estate agent or an insurance agent or a, a business person in the community that it, it was an aid to you. I'm not saying it's right or wrong or indifferent. I'm just telling you what it used to be. To be a part of the First Baptist Church or the First Presbyterian Church or the whatever Catholic Church, it, it was an aid to you because people looked at you and thought that was very well standing. That person's got their head on straight. It used to be that our politicians, if they spoke about their faith in Christ, that that was sometimes... It was a positive thing that they were looked at as a revered person. Not anymore. Nowadays, dear friends, we're living in a day and age where that's a liability to you. And you have to decide at that juncture, are you really going to follow this Jesus and do this real Christianity stuff or not? And I'll say this, that if you're just going along with the crowd and things are just wonderful in your life all the time, there's probably a good chance you aren't living for the Lord. Never, n never a doubt, 
time, whenever I say something like that in one of my messages that I don't get an email and people challenge me on it, go, go, before you send me your emails, go read the Sermon on the Mount. Go check it out in Matthew. Go pull it up. You don't know what it is? Google search it, find the verses, go read Jesus' sermon that he preached the Sermon on the Mount. Don't believe me, especially in there, the Beatitudes. Read the Beatitudes in there. Dear friends, I'm not saying that God wants us to live miserable lives and be paupers and have a horrible life. That's not what I'm saying. But friends, if you never have any kind of conflict because of your faith and you just are always going right along with the flow and everything's always peachy keen in your life, chances are you're not living for the Lord. And let me tell you what, these preachers and these ministries that are out there trying to get you to have your best life now, let me tell you what, when you have your best life now, you know what? You're going to go to hell. If your best life is right now, then the logical end of that is that you're going to spend an eternity in hell. Because my best life isn't now. My best life is when I get to go see my Jesus face to face in heaven. And so we're just walking and washing along. And following in with the crowds and the culture all along, the truths of God's Word are slowly being eroded and withering away. Number two, wrong expectations can blind us to reality. Now, by a show of hands in the room, I'm really good big on crowd participation today. This is so much fun. How many of you have ever gone to a free cookie stand or bought a box of cookies and you're just so excited? It's chocolate chip cookie. How many of you love some chocolate chip cookies in here? It's all right. I love me some chocolate chip cookies. I ran a marathon, though, so it's okay, or half marathon. I did it. I did it. I didn't bring my medal and show you guys one day. Matt. Have you ever got into your chocolate chip cookie, and you got your chocolate, you got your milk, maybe chocolate milk, I don't know, that sounds good, and, and you go to dip it in, you take a big bite out of it, only to find out that you mistook it, and it's an oatmeal raisin cookie. Anybody ever had that happen to you before? That is the worst, man. That is horrible. And the funny thing is, it's like we don't blame ourselves for like, let's read the package or look and investigate. We get mad at the cookie. We're like, stupid cookie, you know, because it's, but all it's trying to just do is be, you know, oatmeal and raisin. And now suddenly we hate everything that is oatmeal and raisin. Now I'm having some fun with you, but it does reinforce the principle that the crowd that day was biting hard into a lie and they didn't even know it. And the thing that bothers me the most about the crowd is that they didn't bother to examine for themselves who Jesus was and why he was there. They were caught up in listening to people's false opinions of who Jesus was rather than doing the hard work of examining the claims of Jesus for themselves. And I wonder if any of you in this crowd are doing the same thing today. Well, Pastor, my, my dad said this about Jesus and Christianity, so I believe what he said. Or my mom and dad raised me in this church or that church and always brought me along, so, so I just, it's got to rub off and kind of flow down to me, right? Or, you know, I grew up Catholic or Presbyterian, and now I've kind of gotten older, and I want to get back in church. But that's a little stuffy, and I'll enjoy that. So, so this is cool. But I was always grown up in church, so that kind of flows down in my life, right, Pastor? It's... Or my buddy says this about Jesus, and I kind of think I like what he says. He's smart. You just blindly bought into the fake cultural Christianity in America today. But my question for you today is, what if your dad, what if your buddy, what if the culture are wrong? Have you ever examined Jesus and Christianity for yourself? Because, friends, you are smarter than that. You are smarter than that. Don't take the crowd's word for it. Make an educated decision based off careful study, not ignorance, and being caught up in the emotional mo momentum of the culture's opinions. Because this is here to tell you all the stuff we think is so new and grand and all these great ideas, and we think we're so enlightened, it's all recycled, just packaged a different way. Go back and read your history, history book. The reality was that the Savior of the world was hanging on the cross, and they were the ones who unknowingly put him there. The reality was that Jesus was dying on the cross for their sins so they could have a right relationship with God. The reality was that God's love was staring at them from the cross and yet they mocked him. And the thing about mockers is that they pay little attention to truth. But they're the ones who end up standing in a grave without even knowing it. And I wish so badly for us as a crowd today, I wish so badly for you that you would take the time to step back just for a second and examine what Jesus said for yourself. 
and not just get stirred up by the crowd. Now, I know that. How do you know it? Right now, you, maybe you got a little bit of a pound going in your heart, got a little bit of an adrenaline rush. Some of you are getting probably angry. You want me to stop talking so you can get out of here? And I just want you to know that that's the Holy Spirit of God speaking to you this morning. And I don't know what He's telling you. For some, maybe some of the stuff that I told you, some of the truths are ringing true to you this morning. You, you truly are a Christ follower. But man, you've just been going back along with the crowd and you've been allowing the culture and the crowds to dictate your life instead of God's Word. But you need to repent and get back on the path and ask God's forgiveness today. L repent of your sin. 